Hello, so here I am all set for my second Facebook Live. Um, a little less, less nervous than last time, but still a little bit nervous. So the last time we spoke to parents of teenagers, or I spoke to parents of teenagers. Today I am expecting more uh, parents of preschoolers on, online, so I'm going to set the context for um, parents of preschoolers. The central message remains the same. Uh, for, whether it's for teenagers or preschoolers, that, that we cannot control what's happening in our world today, but we can influence how our children see this time. So as a parent, firstly, you must accept and embrace um, that this time is happening. And you must also understand and be kind to yourself that what parenting actually means at this time of... Uh, okay, the sorry, I went off for a second. Um, the awareness... Um, also that you can do anything you want but you can't do everything that you want so we want to be kind to ourselves and not all try to be superhuman mums and dads out here um, it's very important that we're calm and present for our children um, and it's possibly the most important thing we can do at this time because um, more than anything else um, our energy and how we react or respond to this time is going to affect our children especially our younger children in a great way so it's more important that um, you know you're calm and present then you're always worried about getting your work done and making sure your child finishes all his schoolwork and making sure that they're hot meals for breakfast lunch and dinner and making sure our homes are clean and making sure everything is perfectly happening the way you know we always uh, superhuman mums and dads want it to happen because times of challenge are not times of perfection or times of high productivity there are times when we must prioritize our emotional and mental well-being over anything else especially for the sake of our young children remember you know when you go on a flight me hostess says uh, make sure you put your own uh, oxygen mask on before putting it on the uh, putting it on your children it's exactly the same thing that we have to do now we have this great wisdom to that because if we are bereft of oxygen uh, there's no way we can feed oxygen to anyone else in our home you know our parental impulse is to take care of everyone else in the house uh, we want to take care of our spouse our parents our children the home the shopping the everything and the fact is that we cannot take care of anybody else we cannot give them their oxygen or their emotional and mental well-being if we do not have um, if we have not taken care to breathe ourselves through this time so work out what you need as a mom or a dad to stay calm and present through this time and um, as your children watch you they will feed off that energy and they will re respond to this crisis in a very very similar way um, as do as you will as a parent once you've taken care of what you need to do to, to be present as a parent, um, you will actually show up in way better ways for your children. You'll show up with love instead of anger, with patience uh, rather than frustration, with hope rather than fear, um, with gratitude instead of um, you know the pain of lack. You, as a society, we've sort of become addicted to um, high productivity and this always on culture. Um, we have extremely high expectations of ourselves and a lot of these come from our own wounded childhood needs uh, for love and approval. We have learned from our childhood that, you know, um, having our room clean, uh, getting an A plus on report cards and being productive and, you know, aligning ourselves with all these rules that come from the external world. Um, these are the times when we'll be loved and accepted. And what, while we've internalized that, we want to be mindful and conscious that we don't allow our kids to internalize that. So this is a perfect time for you to let go of all of those, um, you know, um, pressures on yourself and let go of them for your children as well. A lot of parents are asking about academic learning at this time and you know we've got millions and millions of webinars on learning in the time of COVID-19. I, Even though I'm an educator, I'm going to tell you that academic learning is secondary to our children's emotional and mental well-being at the time. It's also secondary to some of the very, very powerful uh, lessons um, this time can actually uh, um, teach our children. Our children have the ability to learn tolerance. They're living um, with uh, you and maybe grandparents and all in, in such close proximity and you're together all the time. There's a great uh, apt 
there's a great opportunity for your children to learn the power of tolerance. There's the uh, other uh, um, uh, capacity to learn about resilience, um, about uh, kindness, about communication, contribution to helping you as a parent inside the home, um, uh, and, and self-help and independence are some of the great things that your children can learn at this time. Also, more than any, anything else, a really nice, great spirit of optimism. So um, this time can be a time of great self-discovery for you as a mom or a dad. Um, yeah, we know um, as adults, um, you know, in, a, in just one day, we hash over millions and millions of problems in our mind. Um, most adults live in our, in our heads, either in the past or in the future. And this is the best time for us to learn what all spiritual uh, teachings have been teaching us, which is to be present in the moment. So. This is our time of great discovery to be, um, you know, present in the moment, um, right now, here, not in the past, not in the future. We, you know, we rehash something that went over in our head yesterday, then we stress over it, then we think about some future thing that could happen and that we will have to take care of it or we'll have to plan for it. Um, this is not the time. For any of that um, it's not the time to have any frustration around your children not finishing their academic uh, learning your spouse not behaving the way you expect or anything else one of the simplest ways for you to manage all of this is if your spouse or your child um, irritates you or frustrates you in any way just think about how important this can this that uh, is going to be 10 years from now Chances are 99% so of your frustration will run out of steam. Uh, this is the time for you to embrace and teach your child that we are not our emotions, we are not our thoughts. That we can let go of thoughts and emotions on demand. Very, very important for us to teach our kids this. Um, you know, you can think of something that has been limiting you from your childhood um, and you will find that this is something very similar. It's a, it's a trigger that you're showing up with when your child does something that, ang that upsets you or angers you in some way. And at that time, just think about whether you can let it go. Um, think about whether you can respond rather than react and whether you can just let it go. Um, if you feel you cannot let it go, ask yourself if you can just let go of it for that moment. Um, and there itself, you know, you'll start the process of dilution of any worry or any thought that is stressing you out. Um, there's a great technique that I've learned uh, for mindful breathing and it, for any stressful situation you're finding yourself in, it'll, it works and it's called the 478 breathing technique. Um, it's mindful breathing and um, what you'll do with your child if either if your child's going through some amount of stress or you are you will lie down with your child put a cushion on both your bellies and breathe in for four hold for seven and breathe out for eight and breathe out through your mouth if you can and the the the, the reason for the cushion is when you breathe in the cushion should rise and when you breathe out, the cushion will fall. And that's the correct way of breathing. And when you do this, you'll just find that whatever you're feeling, whatever your child's feeling will start to minimize. It'll start to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so one of the great things you can do, as I said, we live most of our lives in our heads in, our, in the past or, the, or in the future. Every morning when you wake up with your child is set your intentions for the day. What is it you're going to plan to do for that day? Not for tomorrow, not for next week, not for next next year, not when this virus is, this virus has disappeared, but just for today. What are you going to set yourself as intentions for today? And ask your child to do the same thing. If your child isn't writing, you can write it for him you or her. You can record it into a, a phone or you can actually ask your child to draw it out with pictures. Whatever your child's intentions are, let him or her draw it out with pictures. Think mindfully when you set your intentions for the day, how are you gonna fill your day with moments of happiness? Whatever that means for you and whatever that means for your child. Another great thing that I'm doing um, all the time is listening to music. Fill your home with music because mu music's got the most profound effect 
on um, mood and your state of mind. Music has known to heal us um, of pain, of illnesses, um, and all scientifically. So it actually releases fabulous uh, chemicals in our body, healing chemicals, uh, chemicals that take away our anxiety, that decrease our cortisol, increase our happiness chemicals. So fill your home with as much music as you can and dancing as a family if you can. Gratitude is another thing um, that is scientifically proven to decrease cortisol and increase happiness chemicals. So think about how you can bring in moments of gratitude through, um, through the day that you have with your kids. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing for the new curriculum is gratitude jars. Um, and you can start experimenting with it right now. Just have a jar of gratitude and in the evening, everyone sits across the table and everyone either draws what they're grateful for on the day or writes what they're grateful for and actually puts it into the jar and there you go you start building a gratitude jar it'll be such a beautiful thing to visit now this is real history in the making it's just such a, such a beautiful thing to visit when all of this uh, time is over and we actually look back for what we're grateful for because i hope we don't forget i hope once life goes back to normal we don't forget all the things, the little things that we took for granted and that we're actually grateful for. Um, another thing that really um, releases happiness chemicals are random acts of kindness. Um, so think about how you can involve your family in that and yourself in that, whether it's sending food to an elderly uh, neighbor. Um, I can see Divya is watching and she tells me her husband does shopping for all the elderly people in the building and I just uh, I, I love her husband but I love him even more now and that's um, just beautiful ways and just imagine what her son is learning from this and everything that you do that's kind and helpful just think about how much you are teaching to your children about uh, being useful about being happy um, you know and being kind uh, it's the best reminder that it's humans we have consciousness and because we have consciousness we have so much of choice that anything we put in our mind is actually a choice um, um, you know I there's this this great story about um, uh, uh, old Cher Cherokee uh, grandfather telling his grandson uh, a story and it's about the two wolves and he says you know one 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 wolf in his brain is about anger does you know envy hatred and the other ones about kindness uh, gratitude and all of that and the child asks him uh, and he says that these two wolves are constantly in battle just like in our heads our thoughts are constantly in battle and the grandson says which wolf wins and uh, the grandfather says whichever wolf you feed so it's a great story to tell our children that we always have the choice um, which wolf we want to identify with in our mind, uh, which experience we want to focus on. We humans actually have a choice. Um, with more and more self-awareness, this, this is something that becomes a more and more apparent um, uh, habit that when we start identifying with something, whether it's a problem, an opinion, a fear, um, a belief, a judgment, whatever it is, um, we have a choice not to do it. Um, that's a very powerful choice. Um, and the moment you as a parent start to reframe your narrative, your story, um, is the time when your children will do the same. Your children will just watch everything that you do. Um, your story and your energy affects your children immensely. Um, I was, you know, uh, it got me thinking about when we have 18 kids and we're settling them in a classroom, um, 17 kids are settled and one kid walks in and the one kid starts bawling, Wah! you've got the whole 18 toddlers now in a sea of tears, all, all howling. So what do we do? We actually take the child who's not settled and we keep him apart. We keep him separately from the other kids because we don't want the other 17 toddlers feeding off the energy and the pain of the one toddler. So remember that your story will become their story. Uh, you know, a great, um, this is a real life story. I was on a plane just after the, the Indonesian bomb blast and I was sitting next to an Australian father and this father, um, uh, you know, we just heard about the bomb blast before we got on the flight and the flight was to Melbourne where my home is. And this uh, father started talking to me and saying, you know, I, um, it's terrible, it's terrible. Um, you know, I, I, my children are settled with me in Bali and now we have to move all over again. And, and it means my, you know, 
my my kids have to make new friends they have to go to a new school they've got all these new challenges blah 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 and i said you know uh, i said to the father you know when we were growing up we shifted from africa to india to um, england to australia and i said whenever we moved my parents made it out to be a great adventure you know you're going to have great new friends you're going to do so many exciting new things you know um, you're going to do your you're going to learn a, you know you're going to be introduced to new food this is, and it's just so powerfully that because of the story my parents told us every time we shifted we actually embraced every shift with um, with that spirit of adventure so what i told to the father is be very careful of your narrative be very careful of your story because however you see this period of time this shift is exactly how your children are going to see it so at this time as we're in the middle of this um, um, we have a suggestion that we can move in our heads that from being locked down to being freed up um, and the things that we really want to free up is our time with our family um, and if there's one rule and only one rule you had to impose on your whole family it is no digital devices at family meal times and I, I shared some interesting things we could talk to teenagers as uh, you know sort of um, open framed questions at the end of the day and we can do that with our toddlers um, with our younger children we just kind of talk to them about you know what did you get better at today whether it was reading, um, what, what are you thankful for today? Um, um, what neg even what negative thought did you have today? Um, and then you help them reframe that negative thought to becoming a positive thought. So these are all very real things um, we can do with our kids. Um, so some parents last week, um, when I was doing the teenage one, a lot of preschool parents came on and they posted messages around bad behavior. And uh, I'd like to address this um, this week because I'm talking to parents of younger children. As we are going through a crisis as, as adults, we're all feeling something or the other, our children are going through their own crisis. And their main crisis is they are feeling disconnected from their friends socially, going to school, all the normal things. Even though we don't articulate it, they know things are not normal. Thing, life is not on as usual. There is something on that is larger, that is not controllable. And when they feel this, when they go through this crisis, um, this is largely where their bad behavior comes from or their acting out comes from. What we need to do as parents is to become aware that there's a very real need behind the behavior or beneath the behavior. And they're displaying these behaviors in exaggerated ways right now because at this time their needs are exaggerated. The moment we identify uh, with and understand and bring up to awareness that they're not acting out because they don't love us, they're acting out because they don't know how to manage the emotionalness um, of the situation, we suddenly come from a uh, different place as a parent. Uh, children, we, we, we understand that our children are not acting out because they're bad. I mean, we all and i know i don't know of a single child who goes to kangaroo kids who is bad they're all beautiful children they're acting out because they're anxious and they don't feel in control um when we bring that to awareness we will move our parenting from our head to our hearts and this is the real time we should all be parenting from the heart and not from the head um, we have to allow our child to express his feelings um, through his actions because he doesn't have the words we can say i do not feel in control of this or i feel anxious about this or but children don't often have the words to articulate how they're feeling and so they're articulated by being defiant or acting out or becoming withdrawn these are his your child's way of articulating feelings we we know that when we face um, anxieties or fears we trigger the reptilian part of our brain the amygdala the part that reacts whenever from you know from from days of yore when we you know from from when we were cavemen we've had this part of our brain that reacts to anything that's scary and it triggers it's the reptilian part of our brain and it triggers what we call the fight or flight res flight response and we do this in very simple ways in as adults when we flee um these are the adults that bury their head in the sand they we over drink we overeat we oversleep we get addicted to something because we're fleeing from the thought or 
dealing with whatever is creating anxiety or we fight so we are angry and we find find that we need to be more in control so just as parents we are aware of our own feelings and we can articulate them to our spouse or in a journal the minute you do that you will dilute the intensity of the feeling so some of the the techniques or strategies are the breathing and the articulation of what we're feeling the moment we articulate it it becomes diluted it becomes less intense um, we also accept that this period of time is not in our control just the mere acceptance dilutes the anxiety as well these simple things we can do and when we do these things we become more responsive and less reactionary more compassionate and less controlling um, so if your toddler acts out and in whichever way he acts out see if you can work out what the need is you know it's very simple we all know for example if our children young children are hungry they will all react in different ways if they're hungry some of them will become really quiet um, someone some will become really cranky and some will become really angry we solve this need by feeding them um, we don't solve this need by yelling or screaming or trying to control them we just solve it by feeding them it's very simple this is the, this situation is no different we if we can work out what the child's need is we can solve it in a very simple way give you an example if your child is craving connection right and i know that a lot of you parents are trying to cope with working as well as the home etc etc just connect when you're cooking cook with your child uh, or when you're cooking have your child seated at you know at somewhere in the that's safe in the kitchen and ask your child to help you sort out the big spoons from the little spoons or you know the forks from the spoons or something like that or um, help you um, shell peas um, if you're sorting laundry have your child just separate the sort the whites from the colored just simple things as you're going around your daily tasks that your child can do something to feel useful and connected with you and you'll find a lot of these things go away a lot of activities you can do in the home um, from Simon Says to musical chairs um, to, you know, um, um, treasure hunts in the home. There are 101 things you can do and you can go online to, um, to Instagram to look for ideas or online. The, the web is just full of great ideas of what you can do with your kids. So just do these things and let your children feel safe and connected. If your children, if you feel your children are missing their friends, um, I know all your mums have these WhatsApp groups and you use them very often to uh, the school's distress to you know to sort of share problems but use it now use it to make your to connect with other parents and set up virtual play dates you can just set up virtual play dates um, with the other family or just child to child or maybe three or four children in a group and there you go you've just got a virtual play date all these things will have your child feel safe and connected and it's you know it's um, Without you using even words, when your child hears um, and understands that, that you're allowing them their feelings, they start feeling honored. They start feeling that their feelings are honored um, by adults. Um, and when you start understanding the need or the feeling beneath the behavior, your children start feeling safe with you as a mom or safe with you as a dad. As I said before, all bad behavior in human beings as a cry for help. Um, the behaviors express themselves differently in children as tantrums or you know, children acting out in adults as addictions. But they're all cries for help. If you ask or demand that your child suppress the feelings, don't do that, stop it now. Um, um, these feelings won't go away. The behavior might go away, but the feelings won't go away. And then guess what? What happens when we repress and suppress our emotional states, our feelings, these will show up as even more heightened, exaggerated bad behavior a little later. Or even worse, these can show up as illnesses in our children. Any repression or suppression of emotional states will show up. It'll show up, um, we parents, we adults know it, that we all store pain, stress, anxious thoughts, anxious emotional states somewhere in our body. I, for example, know that I store it here in my shoulder and I use the breathing technique to breathe through the, the, the emotional states that I've stored right here. But we all store it somewhere. Um, I read today, you know, that um, the 49 year old or 46 year old CEO of, I think, BMW had a heart attack and passed away. 
what's that about? That I mean, he's storing his stress and his emotional states in his heart. Um, we're all storing it somewhere. So we don't, we not, do we do not want this time to lead to any illnesses um, for our kids. Um, there's a book that I just spoke about on a parenting video, um, and it's uh, a book that we're adding, including in our new Kangaroo Kids 2.0 curriculum. And it's, it's, it's part of the building the correct habits of mind through stories um, section of the curriculum that we're doing. The book is called Ruby Has a Worry, and it's just a story about this girl with a worry that can be tangibly seen as an object. Um, sometimes the worry is bigger and sometimes it's smaller. It actually um, um, is a great thing to start talking to kids about. Because as I said, we adults live in our past or in the future, 95% of the time, but children don't. Children live in the present. So it's a great time for us to teach this to children that we can let go of thoughts and emotions in healthy ways. Not by suppressing them, not by repressing them, not by distracting our children so that they don't feel that at that moment, but actually working through them and letting them go in, in healthy ways. Um, so when reading the book, Ruby Has a Worry, um, one of the things we will do with our kids is look at her facial expressions, ask kids to read the expressions. When is Ruby happy? When is she sad? When is she worried? Where is she, when is she angry? Apart from teaching our kids all about emotional states and worries and letting them go, we're also teaching our kids to have a higher emotional um, intelligence. Being able to read body language and faces is part of having a high um, emotional intelligence. I'm getting some stories, uh, some questions through, but I'll just finish this and then um, I'll get to them. Priyanka, thank you. Um, so discuss with your children how our worries grow if we feed them, just like the um, um, Cherokee Indian chief taught his grandson that whatever worries we feed will grow in size. So what do our worries eat and need to grow on? They need our thoughts and our thoughts feed them. So these are very simple um, th things we can talk to children about. Then. Um, when we worry about a worry, what happens? The worry gets bigger. Um, Ruby's worry um, alters in size. So we can ask kids, when was her worry tiny and when was it big? We can actually start getting kids to articulate the size of their worry. You know, when we're talking, when, when, we're, when physicians talk to us about our pain or psychologists talk to us about our emotional states, they ask us to rate it on a, on a scale of zero to 10 how how much pain is there or how much how intense is our emotional state with kids we can actually articulate it physically through shape and size how big is it what shape does it have um, and whenever your child is worried about something your child will immediately be able to identify it in terms of size is it this big or is it you know this tiny so and also start bringing an awareness with your child of where the worry is residing in the child's body some of us store our worries here some of us in our gut some me over here we all store them in different places and as we actually train our children to understand and be mindful of where they're storing their worry they can actually breathe it out so um, um, just go back to using the four, seven, eight breathing technique and doing this at the end of this, you can actually ask this child, a worry that big will actually uh, diminish in size when they, uh, when they breathe through it. Another fact is that the moment you have something around which you can talk to your child about the worry, about the size of it, about where it is, um, that also tends to just bring the worry smaller. What do psychologists do? We just, they're only sitting there. We're actually just talking to them about our worries. And just by virtue of that, we start minimizing the size of the worry. Um, so also talk to your child about setting down the worry like you set down a bag. By objectifying a worry, children begin seeing themselves as separate from their worries and their emotional states. Ask them, ask them to draw their worry like an object. What shape is it? What color is it? By doing so, again, they do not identify that their worry or their emotional state is them. It is separate from who they are. Um, you can also help your children to reframe worries. To give you an example of this, if you say to your child, you know, we have to stay in because the government says we have to and the coronavirus is dangerous and can kill people, these words create a much larger worry. Um, cortisol floods the body and creates stress. Instead of you to say, we are choosing. So we are in control and we're choosing to stay home where the virus cannot reach our bodies. And if we all hide together, the virus cannot find people to live in and the virus will die and we are fighting the virus before it can hurt more people. That itself gives your child a sense of control and that's what we want. So um, 
before I start the questions, all I want to uh, I want to end the note on is be very mindful that the stories that we tell our children will eventually feed into the stories our children will tell themselves about this period of time, about everything. Um, and these stories will actually play out in their own lives. So with that, I'm going to go to uh, my Australian phone. Um, Priyanka has posted some questions. Um, Kushi, Kushi, um, um, Priyanka, stop posting for a second because otherwise I keep losing the, the question. Kushi Siddiqui has asked, how do we keep them busy longer without the use of mobile or television? Well, if you're constantly on the mobile or the television, um, so will your child be. So um, it's just how much time you've got and to, um, to use that time in active engagement. I've already given some ideas of what you can do in terms of activities. There's, 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 a, there's so much of information on the internet of activities you can do with your child. Just, you know, even if you just sort of type in um, activities to do through the virus, the time of the virus, you get five million ideas of what to do. Um, so now I go back. Pri Priyanka, as I said, please stop posting questions for a while um, because otherwise I keep losing the question that I'm reading. Um, how do I get my kids to complete their homework, Sakshi Mehta? As I said, homework is less important than anything else at this time. Um, they're already doing schoolwork. They're already doing online schooling. So um, I would I would earnestly ask you not to stress them with um, let them do what they're happy to do as much as they're happy to do. Um, let them do uh, um, children should not avoid doing um, their homework or their schoolwork because they'd rather watch Netflix. Um, so if you actually schedule times um, for everyone in the family for this is our leisure time now what we do in our leisure time we can read a book we can watch netflix um, um this is our uh family interaction time so what can we do at, during that time we can play pictionary we can play card games we can do things that we where we interact together as a family uh this is our um uh, this is our productive time which is when your child will do his work and you will do your work sitting alongside each other um and at this time, as I said, do not stress too much about um, Deepak Agarwal just says, my child doesn't want to study. Of course he doesn't want to study. <laughs> do you want to work at this time? Um, if you sit down with your child, if instead of saying sit down and study, which is a very transactional way of communicating with your child, if you can have some transformational ways of communicating with your child, which is um, what do you need? To get this done i my me deepak as a father i have to get this done for my office um this is what you need to get done as part of your schoolwork. what do you need from me to help you get through this um and that will then happen um second how do keep kids away from tvs and mobile these days because it's for working periods it's difficult so you as i said you just structure the day your child needs to know that he has so many hours of uh, digital time so many hours with books so many hours with um, um leisure and then during leisure he can again choose a digital device if he wants to watch a cartoon or whatever else just everyone has to structure the day and you're the parent and you get to structure the day for your child um Three, how do we make sure the current circumstances do not scare our kids? At the same time, they understand the seriousness. Shika Chaudhary, well, just the way I just expressed to you, that's exactly the way you will um, uh, speak to your children. Um, you, if you do that, um, the minute you um, speak to them like this, they will understand. There's a very important question here, which I've read. My toddler has lost his sleep during this period. What could be the reason behind it? Anxiety. So you need to go back to um, working out wh where the anxiety is through communication. If your child can communicate, um, you need to see if your child can actually verbalize their communication. And you know what? This is a great time to actually sleep with your child. Um, you know, um, a lot of uh, Western um, psychologists will talk about the ills of sleeping with your child. Um, I've grown up in the West, um, but I've got an Eastern heart and I truly believe that at this time of connection, it's a great time for you to take your toddler and let your toddler sleep with you, cuddle, all of that. 
Uh, another question, my son says he is bored all the time and I'm working from home. I don't know how to keep him engaged. He's 13 years old. Well, it's not your problem to keep him engaged. Um, you know, you need to take them through a process of reframing. What if he's 13 years old, he understands that what do you think children did when the Black Plague happened, when they didn't have television, they didn't have so many toys, they didn't have so many things. Um, if your child is feeling um, privileged and entitled, this is the time to reframe that. Um, if you're bored, you're bored. You've got to work it out. Um, you know, we've got we, we've we've come from a time where we we buy ready-made toys for our kids. This is the this is the time for kids to construct their own play materials. Kids never got bored um, if you gave them marbles or you gave them balls. In this time of so much stimulation and so much distraction, that's where the boredom is coming from. Now it's important to allow them to get bored. Um, very, very important to allow them to get bored because this is where creativity comes from. Um, so, what do we tell our kids who want to eat their choice of food at this time? Bhumi, uh, Dhaka and Suru. It would really help when you ask questions if you tell me the age of your, of the, uh, of your child because what happens is you would express this very differently to if your child's two or to if, if your child's um, ten. If your child's an older child, you'll simply say that it's not possible and um, you know there's nothing that can be done. Um, you can also tell your child, come on, come in, the, come in the kitchen and let's try and cook, you know, whatever you want. Um, have some part in the responsibility of eating what you want to eat. And if your child is younger, then you just have to um, say that it's not possible um, and just say it in a nice way that when this period of time is over, we'll get to eat what we want and at the spirit, at, during this period of time, the KFC, etc., etc., is not open. It may be useful to take them online and show them. It's a great time to teach your kids the difference between want and needs. What you want to eat and what you need to eat are two t completely different things. Um, and um, so, the parent who said that says she will turn six in June. Yes, there's a there's there's a video that went viral on the internet about a kid who wants to eat KFC and McDonald's and throws his tantrum and cries. And you just look at that and say, well, how does that look to you? And most kids will say that looks stupid. Um, well, this is a period of time that KFC is not open and you can't eat whatever you want and um, stores are not open. You just have to tell them the truth. Uh, Preeti Tawakli, what kind of conversation should we have with our teens during this lockdown and keep them happy and entertained? Please go and watch the podcast, the, the Facebook Live I did last week. It's still on the Billabong High uh, site. Uh, please go and watch it. I've expressed everything um, to you then. How do you utilize time in the lockdown, Niranjan Saxena? Well, for yourself as, for, as well as your kids, if you take this time as a time of transformation for yourself, I'm not saying overburden yourself with saying, I have to grow spiritually and emotionally and physically and mentally every day. But if you take this time as a period of reflection and a time when you can actually grow yourself in some ways, this is actually how your child will see it as well. Um, Mina Sony asked me, ma'am, how can I be motivated? Mina, I don't know if you're a parent or a child. Um, so again, if you can just post how old you are, then it helps me. Um, um, so s for yourself, how do you, uh, how do you stay motivated for yourself? Or oh, well, you start off with um, one of the things I read, you know, we tend to make our, our brains love ticking tasks off. So in the morning, when you set your intentions for the day, you set all your productive intentions for the day as well. Also understand motivation. If you're doing something that speaks to your values, you won't need external motivation. So if you're doing something, this is the right time. If you're in a job or something else that needs external motivation, I would ask you to use this time to reflect and rethink. Because when we are aligned with our work and our values align, um, our purpose and our work aligns, the meaning we have in our life and our work aligns, we will need no external motivation. Everything will be internally driven. Nobody needs to tell me that I have to come on Facebook Live or anything else. I think we're back on, okay. Um, how to encourage four-year-old into reading books, Altamas Khan. Um, just start reading to them. Um, we all know that kids who are read to become readers. So start reading to your kids. And then when you have the book time um, that you and your children have, well, also if children watch you read, 
they will start and getting encouraged to read. So children who have parents who are readers become readers. Children who are read to become readers. So there you go. Um, okay, and um, we'll also be doing a special session for toddlers where I will share books and videos you can use for them. So we'll do that um, next time. Um, how do we handle the situation where they want to go to school, their eagerness to go to school, even though they're having virtual classes every day? Pile, uh, Pile Kapoor, you just have to be honest with your kids. Um, if you use the sentence I used, that uh, we are staying safe indoors where the virus cannot reach us um, and we have to do it and you teach them about social distancing, that's um, what to do. There's Rona Kveas, how to make my son develop reading skills. That's another... Um, Facebook Live in itself, and we will deal with that on another Facebook Live. And we'll make sure that uh, Priyanka specifically tells Ronak Vyas when to come online. Uh, Ma'am, can you please suggest my son gets disappointed if someone is not giving him a chance to speak and he starts crying? Umesh Akniyo 3, very simple solution. Allow him to speak. If somebody, if somebody didn't give me the chance to speak, I would start crying as well. So it's all, all people's voices need to be heard, and that's just as simple as that. Um, my 3.5 year old kid doesn't want to go to sit for school live sessions or any live activities being conducted what can I do Nituranka. well one of the things you can do is <coughs> you can engage with a child that your child is close to in the class and you can have a one-on-one -on -one with the child and your child where this child talks to your child about how exciting online schooling is um, and um, says he will hold his hand so there must there may be an anxiety underlying why your kid doesn't want to sit for a, a live school session and if you can work out what that anxiety is and if you can encourage keep saying poor connection okay we're live again um, if you can keep encouraging uh, other kids to talk to your child it should probably um, ease it um, my daughter loves to read and write novels and books all her novels are finished what to do Meenal um, there's a wealth of books on Kindle just go to Kindle and you can download a whole lot of books you don't have to go to a store um, you can download Kindle even on a phone so that's a very easy uh, answer um, how much of COVID-19 story is happening do my kids need to know and how to communicate them to them effectively again Pallab Bhattacharya depends on the age of your child um, we don't want to be watching the news um, in front of our kids um, and constantly be seeing you know the spikes uh, going up and down up and down so because that's going to cause anxiety so what we do want to do is um, we want to access the news in through print even if it's digitally through print rather than where our kids can hear the news and um, you just have to tell them you know if they're younger you just tell them that uh, we're just staying safe where the virus can't reach us that's the amount of information that they need and if they're older um, you can do a lot more um, Pallab Bhattacharya I don't know if you're a parent of kangaroo kids or Billabong High but we've actually created um, journals um, around uh, the coronavirus and if you write into founder f-o-u-n-d-e-r at kkel.com um, and tell us what age your child is uh, Priyanka will be happy to send you a copy of the journal and that communicates everything um, uh, very effectively about what how much your kids need to know um, ma'am how can we keep kids away from the mobile Sashi Mishra it's not about keeping kids away from the mobile it's about uh, what they're doing with the mobile so I actually did a interview with um, 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 somebody very famous that you may or may not have heard of he was the guy who won the first um, million TED prize and he's uh, he, he came up with this experiment called hole in the wall and he suggested that instead of the phone if you project everything on a big screen you won't have fear about keeping kids away from uh, the mobile uh, at all um, and the fact is you can't um, what you can do is have rules or boundaries around the use of mobiles um, and just be consistent and stick to them uh, hi Lena my son is in play school year four at the stage do I expect him to read or spell uh, or is it just reading books Bharti Mahesh um, 
every child is going to develop at a different rate and in different areas. Um, I gave this, uh, this you know, uh, uh, example somewhere. My, I, I taught my niece to read within a week using the same techniques we use at Kangaroo Kids. When I sat down to uh, get my nephew to learn to read, uh, he refused and I just let it go. Um, we don't force kids to learn anything because the minute we force kids to learn anything, learning is no longer a joy, it becomes a chore. We want learning to be an, an adventure. So I'm going to just take one or two last questions um, so that you're not so sick of me and you join me next week as well. Um, Uh, Nisha, right, Chura, how do you deal with a five-year-old and convince him to engage in learning? He tells my my sister, his mom, that she isn't a real teacher. He says teachers are at school only. Yes, teachers are at school only, but we are makeshift teachers at home. Um, Nisha, the first thing is we're not here to control our kids, and especially not at this time. Uh, I would say at no time are we here to control kids, but especially not at this time. Um, we don't convince our kids to engage in learning. We just have our kids have these great learning adventures in front of them and that's what we do um, and we don't force kids to ever learn because we always want learning to be seen as a joyful adventure so with that i'm going to um, call this facebook live to a close um, if if there are questions that haven't been answered uh, please tune in next time because i can't read them actually as they come up on my phone um, I will answer, respond to them next week. So thank you all very much for thank you all for very much for being here, and look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Um, see you then. Bye bye.